if you go to Epicurious uh, and you start participating on the forums there, you're actually going to be using Tidal software. And we're going to meet the uh, founder of Tidal right now and talk about communities and platforms and all this new world of publishing on the web. And who are you? Uh, I'm Matt Myers. I'm co-founder and CEO of Tidal, along with my other founder, Barack Canber. And we're helping make passionate voices a little louder by giving them more exposure. So my background was I came out of school, um, Wharton, doing business, but I always had a tech background. I had been working as an organ transplant database administrator. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of kind of interesting tech stuff. And so I came out of school with a neat combination of both business and tech background. Did some consulting, hopped around, started getting into the web startup scene about five years ago in New York, and it was pretty nascent back then. Yeah. Um, but since then, it's it's really blossomed, yeah, <laughs> and it, it, it become Etsy a huge thing. and Foursquare, it, it, yeah, it, it, right, right, right. Um, and it's awesome, you know, seeing it grow up, and then seeing myself grow up as an entrepreneur. Um, I've been running Title for three years now, and fully bootstrapped, and we now have this awesome client list. Um, yeah. So it, it's. So what is cool it, title is, is did I na nail it? Is it a community? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it, it's a really interesting mix. We have a, a content management system um, merged with a community influencer management platform. So you can see how influential somebody is when they sign up for a program. You can see all the content they're creating. We normalize, bring that content in, and then push it out and connect it to sites, apps, social channels. And so as for an individual, they take what they're already writing on their blog or Instagram or wherever it may be, and it gets more exposure. They become more famous. And for all these big brands, they now have a way to tap into grassroots content to go from you know, a few writers up to hundreds or Thousands. Can we see what it uh, looks like on some of these sites? Yeah, I, yeah. I see you have Teen sure. Vogue up here. The, yeah, and Teen Vogue was our, our first client. Um, and it was, we worked with this guy, Bernie Davis, Condé Nast, and he was kind of identifying this problem that all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, fashion bloggers went from an obscure thing to actually the new way that's setting the trends in fashion. Yeah. Uh, and they wanted to tap into that, the, the fact that now, People are making photo shoots that are, are just as beautiful as what you would see in the pages of Teen Vogue. So this wasn't done by Teen Vogue. This oh, was no. done by <laughs> this woman. Yeah. What's her name? Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, M. Sarah M. here. And so in, in her case, yeah, she could be located in Iowa or, you know, Ukraine or anywhere. Um, and she has some friends that is a photographer. She's going out and shooting. Um, every week posting on her blog, um, but now she has a way to also appear on Teen Vogue, which is really exciting for her. In this case, she's a, a Danish-Australian girl studying fashion print in London. So she has her own presence, Framboise Fashion, maybe I pronounced that right. Yeah. Um, and she's posting her own content, but we also give her a piece of code, she installs it, on her networks shows that she's now affiliated with Teen Vogue. She's been accepted in there. And then we parse and see, what is she creating? What is she talking about? When she does create something, is she getting a lot of comments back? Um, and then can do some kind of... Now, you're not running her blog. You're no, no. Running, so You're not running her comment area on her blog. So you're just we, taking we, that We want to be kind of agnostic. Yeah. Can, people can be creating anywhere. You know, She could be on Tumblr or... She's probably on Blogspot or as WordPress a lot of, or, or, or anywhere, yeah, or in, Instagram. Um, and we, we want to be able to kind of pull from anywhere people are creating and then also process and then push back out to 
sites or Tumblr or any other platform, and in between kind of analyze, does this piece of content look like a good fit for this community? Does yeah. this look like something that would generate page views or action or conversions or whatever it may be? Interesting. You know, using some data analysis, looking at the content, using... But Let's see some other examples, like uh, yeah. some of the other sites that you so, so Team Vogue, we started with them, um, yeah. and that got us into the publishing space. And then we started working with other brands at, at the company that owns them, Condé Nast. And so Epicurious, it's the same basic idea, just instead of fashion, it's foodies. So they, they have their recipe site with some of the most you know, amazing best recipes. Yeah. And we, we own their community stack on top of that. Got it. Um, so all these faces and all the content that's on the community piece of this is coming through your, your platform. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so for them, they, they don't have to build it themselves. They can tap into this. Um, and they have, you know, now we've had other workage. we've had other content uh, com community people like Echo on mm -hmm. here and other others. It sounds like uh, talking to you off camera. Uh, you're a new age uh, uh, platform. You're built on Mongo, and you're so you're very performant, very fast. Right, because um, when we looked at the space a couple of years ago, we said, well, we could we could take what's existing, you know, WordPress or. Um, other ones and kind of build on top of it, or we could start from scratch. <laughs> and we made the decision, we're going to build it from the ground up and kind of make it the, a next-gen social publishing platform, um, which has been great because we can customize it a lot, and it makes it, yeah, just super fast. We, we, we use Mongo, and we use uh, some PHP, a little bit of you know, other languages here and there. Uh, and the response time is, is just instantaneous. It allows us to very quickly crawl and get all these tens of thousands of sources, process it, pull it through, uh, and then serve it in kind of new ways. Um, and you're on the Rackspace cloud too, right? We, we are, yeah. We, we, we had gotten in, um, my, my partner always loved Slicehost, and he said, you know, this is the way to go. And the nice thing about Rackspace cloud is it gives us a less expensive way to really, you know, ramp up. Um, we're, as I said, we never had to raise any money, and we kind of can continue ramping as we add more clients. So, as we've done that, yeah, just continue adding more servers. We have everything is delivered. That you know, Rackspace Cloud has is optimized, so it's right on the edge, and it means it's fast, and we're spending way less than we would be if we're buying this stuff direct. Yeah. Um, tell me, uh, if I was a site that was starting up today and I wanted a, a community platform like mm -hmm. Titles, uh, how much would I have to pay? Because it, it, it's not, so, it's not a, buy an iPhone app for $3. No, right? no. <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're, you know, concentrating on, on companies and brands that are a little more enterprisey and kind of where it's a good fit. So we have turned clients away because we really want these areas that, people are passionate, excited, and we're, it will work really well. Um, so it, it, it is a SaaS fee, and it's a couple thousand a month, and there's some sort of implementation at the beginning that we can do, or the client can do. Like, so some of our clients are a lot more advanced. They're yeah. startups, and they just, great, give us the APIs, you know, we'll manage everything through the back end, and then we'll do the front end skinning and stuff mm -hmm. ourselves. What are some mistakes that you've seen? Because I, I know I worked at Microsoft and I saw they really struggled at bootstrapping communities. They didn't. They understood the the skill set of the employees there was really good mm -hmm. at keeping one that was already going going and yeah. keeping it you know clean and getting rid of spammers and and trolls and stuff like that. But they didn't understand the bootstrapping. So what kind of mistakes do you see companies making when they approach? community uh, development like this. And, and that can be the, the tough part is, you know, we have an awesome tool set and it allows you to easily manage the users and all the content, um, but that's only halfway, if, if even that. The other half is the care and feeding, <laughs> which does, you know, the results you'll get are proportional to how much effort is put in on the side of actually creating a community, as, as you know. And that takes the constant 
going through and interacting and figuring out who's good and who should be elevated. And so for us, we think of it as like, well, technically, we're going to create a platform where it makes it really easy to do that. You can go through, um, review people very quickly, assign them behind the scenes editorial scores. We'll make suggestions around what we think their grade is and how prolific they are, what's their sphere of influence. But in the end, it's a little bit subjective. <laughs> you know, who's creating great photography or content? And there has to be a little bit of talent recognition and lifting up, uh, giving people badges and grades. And so then you have this kind of tiered pyramid of, you know, up top is your, your editors and your community managers and then all kinds of levels underneath. There's paid and unpaid contributors and there's, you know, fashion experts in LA and yeah. <laughs> kind of everybody segmented out. And, the ones that really succeed um, in the space around this kind of up and coming contribution succeed really big, but it takes a lot of effort. And, yep. and that's like Bleacher Report and HuffPo and ones that built their own platforms. The contributors and the content is only like the first step and it takes a lot of like massaging and lifting up and you know. No, it's true. Of, it's true even on uh, uh, Facebook or, or uh, Google Plus. But if you're not there every day and tending to your uh, community, you're going to see those people leave and go somewhere else. Right? Yeah, Cause, yeah, cause for the sure. the conversation just won't be on your items. It'll be on somebody else's. Exactly. Items. And so that's where we make it really easy for people to get involved. They can yeah. syndicate from wherever they are. Um, but there has to be somebody on the other side giving people recognition and them know that, like, yeah, you're part of something. This is really cool. This content was awesome. Uh, we're going to feature it in the you know home page we're going to help distribute it for you we're going to put it in the print magazine which is happening now and kind of yeah. people get really excited about that because yeah. they may be doing it just for fun in the evenings and weekends to be like hey look at look at this <laughs> it's so, cool so you bootstrapped your company you haven't mm -hmm. taken any, any investment that's pretty no, pretty no. outstanding and um, tell me about the company you're building how many people are there so, so we're up to eight people now and built, you know, awesome product with a lot of applicability. And we kind of fell into the bootstrapping thing. At first, we went through an incubator, Dream Adventures, and a lot of our, our cohorts, um, the ones that survived, most of them raised money. We kind of looked at, and we, at first, we were trying to raise money before we really knew what we were doing, which is yeah. typical. Um, but then we signed a client. They started paying us before we had really had much of anything built. So we realized that they're kind of financing the build out a little bit. Um, built something and then, hey, now we, we have something kind of rough and decent that maybe we can try selling elsewhere. And continued to slowly build up that client list and managed to do it without bringing on VCs and a whole board and all that, which gives us a lot of flexibility in where we take this and how we grow the company and what directions we can move into. That's great. Where do we find, uh, where do we find Tidal? Because it has a unique URL. It, it, TID.AL, yeah, it's an Albanian URL. Yeah. Um, they, all the dot coms are gone, so we're like, yeah, we, how do we, you know, <laughs> hack this? You have to, you're supposed to have like a presence in Albania. And you're supposed to show you have an office in order to get an Albanian URL, but you know, you find a guy, and <laughs> it's, it's good. Well, thank you so much for coming out and showing it to me, and uh, thanks for what you're doing for the web. Yeah, I appreciate it, Robin. Thank you.